Hey, welcome to the Backyard Professor Sunday Night Fireside. Hang on, I've got to text one of you to let you know I'm on. How is everyone? All right. Tonight is going to be a really important night, in my humble opinion. And I am humble and I am opinionated. <laughs> yeah, whatever. How's everybody's week been? I'm not going to dawdle like I did last time. I've been talked to by several people. They say you take too long to get to the point and show us something solid. So I'm going to begin pretty pronto prompt right at six o'clock in three minutes. Tim Rathbone, how you doing, my friend? Yeah, good to see you, friend. It's always good to see you. It's always good to see all of you, man. And Doug Vincent, here I am. Yes, hello, Doug. Doug and Tim, I was just saying, I've been talked to about uh, dawdling too much without getting to the subject, so I am going to jump right on it tonight, uh, just as soon as it gets to be six o'clock. So anyway, um, I'm looking forward to this. I have some really important information. Some of it's a little bit old, but uh, some of it is extremely brand new, as in just since Friday that I want to cover. A lot of uh, information on the, uh, well, the Joseph Smith translation of the papyri, of course. That's always a critical subject. Splunky doink, how you doing? And I'm going to talk about Joseph Smith's book of Abraham and Joseph Smith and John Gee and Kerry Moolstein and some of the apologetic attempts at saving Joseph Smith, which I don't think they have succeeded at in any manner, way, fashion, or form. And that's unfortunate for them. But I'm also going to explain yet again through examples of some of the manipulation tactics that I see going on in the, uh, the apologetic world, the Mormon defense world of why I just cannot be an apologist anymore. It's just not going to. Ryan Larson, good to see you again here, my friend. Hello, everybody. Looks like we're all getting here. So uh, it it is uh, one more minute, then I'm going to start. Uh, I've had a good week this week. This is a subject that just you can't. I just found a new, entirely new presentation. Uh, that I had not any idea existed and uh, new information again with which I want to analyze. And I am reading through Ryan Larson's meditations on Doug, on Dan Vogel. Sorry, Dan Vogel, if you're here, uh, Ryan Larson, I, I am reading your meditations and I find them exquisitely interesting and we will be talking about them. I will begin to share some, I, I'm not trying to put you on the back burner. I promise. I'm, I'm just, I've got other stuff that's ahead of you and yet I'm trying to incorporate some of your excellent insights. So just so you know, uh, Ryan Larson, you're very welcome. Uh, all the rest of you, if you can look up Ryan's meditations on Dan Vogel, he asks some really good questions, some good questions that I think we all need to be asking just exactly like Dan Vogel does. I just read today. I acquired it on Friday. I just read Dan Vogel's new book on the book of Abraham apologetics, a very important source of analyzing the context of uh, so much involving the uh, Egyptian alphabet and grammar and the Egyptian alphabet and, and Joseph Smith and his scribes, et cetera. A lot of good information, excellent analysis. So, yeah, very good book. Okay, it looks like there's 10 of us. Okay, it is 6 o'clock. Uh, I promise myself I will not extend this into too long of an introduction. <laughs> and uh, it looks like we've got enough of a group. I'm going to get started. So here we go. Yes. Um, let me just say, first off, 
Uh, I appreciate all of the comments, the emails, the uh, the phone calls, et cetera, that I get from and Tim Rathbone. I need to email you too. We've got to start talking a little bit more too. Uh, I appreciate all of that, but my my approach this time is going to be on John Gee. Uh, because he is so prominent, and because he is an Egyptologist, and because he does have a PhD from a very good university. But uh, I vehemently disagree with his approach to all of this, and it is part of John Gee's approach that has caused me to see why I can no longer be a Mormon apologist. And so I quit apologetics in part because of how the apologists have been acting with the evidences. And that's what I want to talk about. Oh, Splunky doing. Thank you. That's what I want to talk about tonight. That's how I want to uh, approach this is to say the approach of LDS apologetics just, you know, there's no better way to explain it, but you guys have got to pull your heads out. You're not doing very well, uh, you apologists. So, John Gee, I'm going to focus on you. I am going to discuss a little of Kerry Mulstein and others. In the review of books on the Book of Mormon, now this was one of Farm's earlier publications, and this is volume four, 1992. John Gee reviewed uh, Charles Larson by his own hand upon papyrus. And of course, he squabbled about a whole bunch of uh, trivial irrelevancies and and nitpicked his way through this. Uh, yeah, sure, Larson could have done a better approach historically, but John Gee's review did not do justice to Larson's analysis of the materials that we now have, and it has been extended incredibly through the last 20 years. Here is what John Gee says. On page 107 of this text, in 1842, the fragments that we now have in the Joseph Smith papyri were mounted in a number of glazed slides, like picture frames containing sheets of papyrus with Egyptian inscriptions and hieroglyphics. The next year, in 1843 now, a non-member named Charlotte Haven visited Lucy Mac Smith and wrote a letter to her own mother about it. Then she, Mother Smith, turned to a long table, set, up, set her candlestick down, and opened a long roll of manuscript, saying it was the writing of Abraham and Isaac written in Hebrew and Sanskrit, and she read several minutes from it as if it were English. It sounded very much like passages from the Old Testament, and it might have been for anything we knew, but she said she read it through the inspiration of her son, Joseph, in whom she seemed to have perfect confidence. Then in the same way, she interpreted to us hieroglyphics from another role. One was Mother Eve being tempted by the serpent, who, the serpent, I mean, was standing on the tip of his tail, which with his two legs formed a tripod and had his ear, or had his head, to Eve's in Eve's ear. So the way John Gee sets this up is he said, the vignette described matches none of those in the Joseph Smith papyri we have from the Metropolitan Museum. And there seem indeed to have been two long rolls even after the present fragments of the Joseph Smith papyri were mounted. And if there were only two rolls. It is important to note that Joseph Smith Papyri 1 and 11 were not on them. So that's pages 107 and 108. Hey, Lamb Chop, well, welcome. Dan Vogel, hello, Dan. Good to meet you. I was just bragging about your new book that I acquired, and I am in the process of Go, I'm going to do a review of your excellent book on Book of Abraham Apologetics. Welcome to the group. I just read John Gee, uh, his his article, his review of Charles Larson. So that's how John Gee handles this. Now, I just want to quickly show you this and then share the further LDS apologetic that is occurring 
This is Henry Caswell's description of his experience being shown the papyri and the mummy. The part that I have yellowed is the only part that John Gee uses. True story. In other words, John Gee uses less than one-tenth of Henry Caswell. Then he uses, misuses, Charlotte Haven's account, and then John Gee splices those two together. Now, I will read Caswell's full account here in a minute. I just want to point out something else that is seriously quite remarkable and seriously stunning. John Gee is not the only one. Carrie, Carrie, sorry. Uh, Michael Dennis Rhodes, I apologize. Same book, Review books on the Book of Mormon. This is for the volume for 1992. Michael Dennis Rhodes also had a discussion of the Book of Abraham as divinely appointed scripture and reviewing Charles Larson. Here's how Michael Dennis Rhodes puts it. This is on page 121. He says, the papyri that the church now has in its possession are clearly not all that Joseph had. There is no reason to assume that any of those we now have is the original of the book of Abraham. In fact, there is good reason to think we have, in fact, do not have the original in 1842. The fragments that we now have were described as being mounted in a number of glazed slides like picture frames containing sheets of papyrus with Egyptian inscriptions and hieroglyphics. And then he references to Henry Caswell. Then Rhodes continues, the next year in 1843, Charlotte Haven, a non-member, visited Joseph Smith's mother, Lucy Mack Smith, and wrote a letter to her mother about it, saying that she, Lucy Smith, turned to a long table. She set her candlestick down and opened a long roll of manuscripts. And it was the writing of Abraham and Isaac written in Hebrew and Sanskrit. And she read several minutes from it as if it were English. Thus, a contemporary source indicates that the scroll of the book of Abraham was not part of the papyri fragments now in possession of the church. This is how John Gee and Kerry Moustein or I mean, uh, Michael Dennis Rhodes, I apologize, treat Henry Caswell's testimony. The part in yellow is the only part they use. Now, interestingly enough, Carrie Moulstein in 20... Carrie Moulstein all over the place. In 2017, in the Fair Mormon Review with uh, Stephen Smoot, this was uh, posted. I think the interview happened in 2013, I believe. But oh, here it is an interview with Carrie Mulstein, Fair Mormon. Yes, in 2013. It was posted in 2017, apparently. Interview in 2013, Carrie Mulstein said this. And I, I mean, this is page four or five in a printed. Yeah, in a printed idea. He says the historical documents make it clear that we have very little of the papyri Joseph Smith had, even after several fragments were mounted to paper and put under glass. Presumably, this is what we have now. The eyewitnesses say that there was a large roll and another roll smaller, but presumably still sizable of papyri. This means that the largest portion of the papyrus collection is not the fragments that we now have, but rather has been lost. Okay, that's how Molstein described it in his fair interview. Okay, and in another one, 
the book of Abraham, Joseph Smith Revelation, and you. This was a devotional which Moolstein gave to the kids in Hawaii. I believe it was in 2017. Here is how Kerry Moolstein put it. I printed this out, uh, page four of six pages, to understand the comments of these eyewitnesses, we must first know that Joseph Smith owned two sizable scrolls, one larger than the other, in addition to a number of papyri fragments. At some point, some of these fragments and probably a number of the pieces of the scrolls that had been cut off were glued to paper and put under glass. This was probably done in an effort to better preserve them. Not probably. That was specifically mentioned. Uh, facsimile one was one of these mounted fragments. Those eyewitness accounts that speak of the source of the book of Abraham indicates that the long roll was that source, even after the fragments had been mounted and were kept separately. Thus, our third way of testing our theory, the actual historical sources, demonstrates that the assumption that we have the original papyrus that came uh, was the original of the book of Abraham has been proven incorrect according to Molstein. Just last night, I was reading Randall, Lar Randall, sorry, Ryan Larson's Meditations on Dan Vogel, and he linked to a presentation by Tim Barker on Fair in 2020, where he titled it Translating the Book of Abraham, The Answer Under Our Heads. Hope everyone's having fun. Hey, RFM. Hey, Patty Cake. Good to see you. Double Deutero, Deuterine, yeah, Lamb Chop, all of you. Joe, thank you for coming. Welcome, everybody. I'm in the middle of obfuscation. <laughs> Tim Barker. At the four minute, 15 second mark in the video, describes the Henry Caswell testimony and Tim Barker does the same thing that John Gee and Kerry Molstein does. He only uses what is in yellow of Henry Caswell's testimony. Nobody seems to want to give the full context of what Henry Caswell said. Now, this is deeply ironic because in the, 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 the way they take Caswell's testimony and splice it in with Charlotte Haven, what they're doing is they are creating an artificial historical context which gives a third missing scroll. But this idea is not had in either witness by themselves. Henry Caswell never talked about a third missing scroll, and neither did Charlotte Haven talk about a third missing scroll. They are creating an artificial historical evidence for an ad hoc theory that has absolutely no evidence whatsoever. Dan Vogel in his new book, Book of Abraham Apologetics, describes this very powerfully toward the end of his book. What I want to do is share with you something else quite remarkable. What we are seeing here, and it is, again, I say this too often, but it is unfortunate for the Mormon community and for the Mormon apologists and for those coming up who want to become Mormon apologists, that their own scholars are misusing the evidence. This can't be accidental, you guys. There, there's no accident here. It's, it's not a matter of the eye skipping and, oh, whoops, sorry, I missed that line and all that. This is a deliberate crafting of taking just a specific piece of one piece of evidence and splicing it in with another piece of evidence in order to create something that helps them save Joseph Smith. And they keep doing it. And people keep following along after that. 
It is deeply ironic that it is the Mormon apologists who are manipulating the historical evidences, and it is the anti-Mormons, Gerald and Sandra Tanner, who tell the truth about those witnesses. I'm going to read Caswell's full text right here, right now. Having introduced me together with several Mormons to this sanctum sanctorum, he locked the door behind him and proceeded to what appeared to be a small chest of drawers. From, his, from this, he drew forth a number of glazed slides. Here is where John Gee, Kerry Mulstein, Tim Barker, and every other Mormon I've ever run into that's defending Joseph Smith through the witnesses. Here is where they start quoting Henry Caswell. He, he drew forth a number of glazed slides like picture frames containing sheets of papyrus with Egyptian inscription and hieroglyphics. And that is where they stop. Right there, the yellow. Now let me read the rest of what actually happened and what Henry Caswell actually said. These had been unrolled from four mummies, which the prophet had purchased at a cost of $2,400, an enormous sum. By some inexplicable mode, as the storekeeper informed me, Mr. Smith had discovered that these sheets, the ones under the glass, that he is being shown, Caswell specifically says he discovered that these sheets contained the writings of Abraham written with his own hand while in Egypt. And that is what the apologists do not want you to know about Henry Caswell. They'll label him as an anti-Mormon. They'll ridicule him. They'll make sure that you're absolutely biased against him. And then they will deliberately misuse, miss context, and stop short. They never quote Caswell saying that the glass sheets in these picture frames are the writings of Abraham. They won't do it. Everyone skips that part. But Caswell's not done yet. Pointing to the figure of a man lying on a table, he said, that is the picture of Abraham on the point of being sacrificed. That man standing by him with a drawn knife is an idolatrous priest of the Egyptians. Abraham prayed to God who immediately unloosed his bands and delivered him. Now, this is obviously facsimile number one that Caswell is being shown under one of those glass slides. Now, obviously, the other parts under those glass slides are the pieces that facsimile number one was cut from, which is, I've shown this almost every video I make because it is critical to stay clear here. Obviously, facsimile number one is being described. So, the writings of Abraham is that book of breathings next to it. It makes perfect sense that that also is under the glass slide because that is what was being preserved and greatly respected according to other witnesses' descriptions. Josiah Quincy, etc. So it's being described. This is what the apologists will not quote from Henry Caswell to everyone else. And Caswell continues, turning to another of the drawers and pointing to an hieroglyphic representation. One of the Mormons said, Mr. Smith informs us that this picture is an emblem of redemption. 
Do you see those four little figures? Well, those are the four quarters of the earth. And do you see that big dog looking at the four figures? That is the old devil desiring to devour the four quarters of the earth. Look at the, this person keeping back the big dog. That is Jesus Christ keeping the devil from devouring the four quarters of the earth. Look down this way, this figure near the side of Jacob, and those are his two wives. Now, do you see those steps? What? I replied. Do you mean those stripes across the dress of one of Jacob's wives? Yes, he said. That is Jacob's ladder. That is indeed curious, I remarked. Jacob's ladder standing on the ground and only reaching up to his wife's waist. Every bit of Henry Caswell's description fits the papyri that we have right now. And yet I just read where John Gee says none of it fits. Now, Kerry Mulstein, without any scholarly attempt at all, simply copies John Gee. Michael Dennis Rhodes, without ever contexting anything, simply follows, well, we don't know if it was Michael Dennis Rhodes or John Gee who miscontexts stuff. But it was the Tanners in their article, Solving the Mystery of the Joseph Smith Papyri, that demonstrated without question that the idea is the evidence from the history of the church, of course, says there are only two scrolls, not a third missing one. And that after they quote, misquote, misuse, mislabel Henry Caswell's testimony as if that's all he had to say, which it wasn't, they say one of these two authors did the original research on this question but failed to realize that if the quote from Caswell was taken in its entirety, which Mormon apologists will not do. It would refute the entire argument that there was another role of papyrus because Caswell identified those fragments as the writings of Abraham by his own hand upon papyrus while he was in Egypt. In other words, that's the original of the book of Abraham. And he was describing facsimile number one. And we know that facsimile number one comes from the book of Abraham. Now, Kerry Mulstein is on record saying that there is no evidence, very precious little, that facsimile number one uh, is associated with the book of uh, breathings other than just being part on the same role. And there's no evidence Joseph Smith thought the book of breathings was the original of the book of Abraham. And it's been a few videos back since I demonstrated at least eight or nine points that shows Kerry Mulstein's understanding of the situation is minimal at best. Now, my question to the Mormon apologist is simply this. There's no way, and, and, and I think we can all come to an agreement here. I think we all understand this intuitively. There is simply no way you could manipulate evidence like this and receive a PhD. Your, your, your committee chair just would not allow that. I, come on, guys, seriously. So now that you have your PhDs, why do you think it's okay to start acting this way with the historical evidence now. I would really like uh, some Mormon apologists to come online, make a video of your own or whatever, or come and talk to me, email me, and answer that question. Because this is deliberate manipulation. We have the full context of the witnesses. It's astonishing that 
Mormon apologists think they can just take a small splice and ignore the identification and create a false historical context that we now know is false and non-historical. How can you guys continue to imagine that you're going to get away with this? Unfortunately, you didn't. <laughs> now, here is something quite stunning and remarkable that I also discovered in my research on this topic. Last week, I really ranted and raved and praised Kerry Mulstein about his article on the Joseph Smith's biblical view of Egypt in this fabulous book, Approaching Antiquity. It's a 2015 book. In this chapter of Kerry Mulstein, I don't think if he understood the full ramifications, he ever would have published this. I really don't. But let's see how he handles Henry Caswell's account in 2015, as opposed to how he did in 2013. He says, Henry Caswell visited, and this is on page uh, 456, okay? So Henry Caswell visited Mabu in 1842, and he provided a third-hand account of Joseph Smith's ideas about biblical connections with the papyri that Joseph Smith owned. Caswell was hoping to meet the prophet and see the antiquities. Joseph Smith was not in town when Caswell called on him, but Caswell was able to prevail upon a storekeeper to let him in to see the sheets of papyri. Now notice how Molstein handles Henry Caswell's account. Again, only this time, he does it from the opposite end. Remarkable. One of the Mormons said, Mr. Smith informs us that this picture is an emblem of redemption. Do you see those four little figures? That is the old devil desiring to devour the four quarters of the earth, etc. What? Kerry Molstein has done with Henry Caswell's account is so astonishing, I can't hardly believe it. In the first instance, Molstein only quotes what's in yellow. It's directly below that part here that Caswell identified the picture frames under glass as the writings of Abraham written by his own hand while he was in Egypt. In other words, it's his book. What he's describing is the book of breathings. Now, Molstein still skips that part and he goes directly to this part of the testimony. Molstein just cannot bear that Caswell was very clear in identifying <laughs> the sheets. They're called that, I promise. Ask Dan Vogel. He's in, the, he's in the chat, I'm telling you. The sheets under the glass were identified as the writings of Abraham. Mormons don't want you to know that. So what what Molstein does is he again skips that part, but he does include the rest of the description, which is obviously the judgment scene in, in other parts of the papyri, right? So he's at least giving a fuller account of Henry Caswell, but he still eliminates the crucial part of Caswell's testimony. And then he says, because this is an account of what Caswell recalls of an unknown person reporting what Joseph Smith said about the papyri, we must use caution in ascribing any of this to Joseph Smith. Now that makes sense, but let's keep reading. However, Caswell also heard a description of the meaning of what must have been the original source of facsimile one. What he recounts of that description matches perfectly with what had been published about the facsimiles only one month earlier. In other words, Caswell is reporting truthfully because we have the same descriptions elsewhere of other witnesses. 
such precision and reliability, Molstein says, suggests that we can place a certain amount of trust in Caswell's other account of Joseph Smith's interpretation. But not when Caswell identifies the writings of Abraham under the sheets of glass as fragments. <laughs> I think that is hilarious how terrified the apologists are of letting Caswell describe what he saw. And yet, Molstein here is saying, hey, look, he's credible. He's a good witness. Because we have other cross checks. Yes, indeed, we do, Carrie Molstein. We really do. Why are you still manipulating the testimony then? Because the apologists know that the original of the book of Abraham Papyri, which we do have. Right there, the book of readings, from which facsimile number one came from the book of Abraham. They know that the translation doesn't support Joseph Smith's book of Abraham. There is no book of Abraham here. It is just an Egyptian funerary text. That's why they manipulate the historical testimony of Henry Caswell. And it's the anti-Mormons, ironically, Gerald and Sandra Tanner to boot, who called them out and showed how phony this type of scholarship is. This is not scholarship. This is mere apologetics. And there is a vast difference between the two. Uh, because Mormon <laughs> researchers scholars keep committing the same indiscretion against historical evidence, valid historical evidence now, according to one of the abusers of Caswell, Kerry Mulstein, who says, actually, he is a credible witness to the biblical aspects of Joseph Smith's understanding of the papyri is that not completely astonishing? That should blow your mind. This is breathtaking. I, I wonder if John Gee read this yet. Because everybody seeks to misalign or malign Henry Caswell. But he's got the best description of the original book of Abraham, the writings of Abraham, in the papyri, and it wasn't on a long lost third scroll. Molstein shows the biblical provenance was from Joseph Smith himself. And the witnesses that he talks about, and he has the Levitt account. He has the Brown account. He has Oliver Cowdery's account. He has William Appleby's account. He has Charlotte Haven's account. He has Josiah Quincy's account. He has the Sharp account that all of the witnesses credibly and probably demonstrate that Joseph Smith really did understand the biblical nature of the papyri. And there's our fraud in, in plain open daylight because there is nothing about Bible anything. Jacob's ladder in the Egyptian papyri? No. No, that's just a complete misunderstanding of what that being yet shows. Uh, the plan of redemption, the serpent Tempting Mother Eve, Adam and Eve in the papyri, J Jacob's book, and the, the discussion of the lost ten tribes. None of it. Pharaoh Necho, the Pharaoh that defeated Josiah in the Old Testament. None of the biblical material is even real. It's, it's not even a reality. 
And yet that is the basis. That is the core. That is the anchor understanding that all the Mormons received from, of course, Joseph Smith. They identified his biblical knowledge from revelation, from heaven. One account specifically says it was Jesus Christ, but others say, well, it was heavenly inspiration. The Pratts and one other, I believe it was Woodruff, said either the seer stones or the Urim and Thummim. But it is mind-boggling that it takes the anti-Mormons, the ones who, when I was a teenager, absolute taboo, forbidden, do not look at the tanners at all. No, stay away from them. They are bad people. They are anti-Mormons. Walter Martin, absolutely not. Do not look at anti-Mormon literature. Isn't it stunning that it is the Mormons who have the truth, who have to manipulate the evidence in order to get to the right answer, and it is the anti-Mormons who are actually telling the truth. I mean, that's, that's thick. I know I'm repeating myself. I promised I wasn't going to. That's my analysis of why I say you can do whatever you want. I, I'm not here to counsel you on how you approach this issue. Me, I do not. I cannot, in all good conscience, accept, believe what any Mormon scholars say anymore. This is the kind of crap that made me stop being a Mormon apologist. And I, not without very sincere and serious, careful examination, am I ever going to believe a Mormon apologist ever again on any subject. Now, I'm more than willing to discuss stuff with them. I don't have anything against them personally. John Gee is a fine person. So is Carrie Mulstein and all that. Their scholarship sucks. I want that crystal clear. They are manipulating the historical materials in an absolutely false way. There is no way they would have been able to do that to get their PhDs. Not a chance in hell then why do they think they can do it now? Because they're still haunted by the ghost of their mentor, Hugh Nibley. And he stupidly argued, and I mean stupidly argued, that method doesn't matter. The only thing that's important is arriving at the right answer. And uh, pray tell, who gets to determine that? Because they aren't letting the evidence do that. They don't follow the evidence where it leads. They manipulate it so that they can get the right answer, which is their testimony, faith-promoting, building of knowing that Joseph Smith's a true prophet, etc. That's all bunk. And then they expect you to think that the Holy Ghost is going to testify to you that their interpretation is true. That is pure bunk. That can't possibly work. The Holy Ghost, assuming, of, of course, you got to assume, okay, let's give him credit. Let, let's just grant that the Holy Ghost is real and it exists and that therefore it is the testator to truth as Jesus taught in the New Testament. Let's, let's assume that it really does know all of the truth and it's not going to lie because the Old Testament says one of the seven deadly sins is God hates a liar, you know. Well, except for Mormons. Mormons are an exception because they hold the Holy Melchizedek priesthood or stuff. I mean, who knows what the hell these guys think? after you see him manipulating stuff like this. There is no way the Holy Ghost is ever going to testify to you that their version is true. It can't because their version is manipulated. They didn't follow the evidence where it's supposed to lead. They change it. They recontext it. They splice and dice. They leave some out. They put some in, and then they reintegrate it in 
ways that the original evidence could not possibly have pointed to. And then they say, see, that's the truth. I bear you my testimony that I know Joseph Smith is true. It's bunk. <laughs> that's why I can't be it anymore. So anyway, I've done enough ranting and raving. Let's take another look at another issue that involves John Gee. Now, this was early on in his career. I happen to have the two articles that uh, Ed Ashman reviews here. Now, when, when I got this stuff, I was still an apologist right there. Ah, any of you recognize this? Yes, sir, Rebob. Farms, insights, woohoo! An ancient window. Yeah, baby. I used to love getting these, man. Come on, it was fun. You know it was, right? Check this out. Reference to Abraham found in two Egyptian texts. John Gee. And he did a he did a pretty good write-up. There's the rest of his article in that. This was for, I mean, this is this is like ancient history, man. This was like uh oh, let's see, 1991, number five. Farms. And and then after he made a splash with that, uh, the church apparently heard about it and they said, dude, 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 man, that's faith promote. That strengthens my testimony. This is big. This is huge. You mean ancient Egyptian texts are supporting Joseph Smith's book of Abraham? Oh man, you've got to write up an article in the end sign. Do an article for the church and the ensign. And man, did John Gee make a splash. Woohoo! 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 Yeah, baby. Abraham in ancient Egyptian texts in the ensign, the church's official publication. Yeah, baby. Research and perspectives. Look, not any moron gets to publish this crap. Only those qualified, right? He shows the lion couch. Oh, yeah, baby. Now, what, Gee? Oh, and the, see the, the graphics in this that are so cool. He shows four times where the wedge on eye is in the hypocephalus. And this is so confirmatory of Joseph Smith. Ooh, and then he shows Anubis with the mask and the, the mask of Anubis with the priest. And I mean, you know, you got the cool graphics. And of course, you got to show facsimile number one. Come on. This is going to confirm Joseph Smith. There's the other hypo, the, the uh, facsimile, the lion couch. And the reason I'm making such a big woohoo whoop de doo about this is because when I was an apologist and I found this stuff, I'm not kidding. I jumped my sorry butt on the internet and I typed 200,000 words a minute and I spread this all over creation. I sent radio signals to the Andromeda galaxy that we have confirmation of Joseph Smith and the book of Abraham. Now, baby, this was huge. And it's all bunk. <laughs> no joke, man. <laughs> Ed Ashman, who was John Gee's nemesis, another student of Egyptology, said, all right, let's take a look carefully at this. Now, understand, he had his master's degree at this point, right? And here's the reason why I'm using him as a, as a uh, uh, let's say, an example, as a foil against all others. Because in two recent articles, now this is Ed Ashman, uh, the use of Egyptian magical papyri to authenticate the book of Abraham. Now, I don't know if all of you have seen this or not. If you haven't, you should. Uh, if you have, I apologize for the repetition, but it's always good to review because I have a new insight here that I'm trying to illustrate through the evidence, right? So we've got John Gee's materials here. Uh, I can personally 
confirm and verify. And if you're really skeptical, I will do an extra live session where I literally read both of John Gee's articles out loud to you so that you can see that I know, but I can verify that Ed Ashman is responding to John Gee's arguments. Instead of reading back and forth, I'm just going to read Ed Ashman, okay? There's going to be some who say, oh yeah, all you did is side with the anti-Mormon. <laughs> Go soak your head in a tub or something, will you? I've read both sides. I don't have time to read both sides tonight. I've already been going almost an hour. I've got to at least give you the idea illustrated. Gee appeals to ancient Egyptian documents in an effort to what? Not learn the Egyptian documents and the Egyptian ideas. He wants to establish authenticity with the book of Abraham. Yes. This is John Gee's mindset. This is critical. Absolutely critical. Because I'm beginning to think it's every Mormon Egyptologists and apologists and scholars mindset. They're not interested in what can we learn from the evidence. They're interested in only one thing. What can we do to the evidence to make damn good and sure it supports Joseph Smith. And that's the essence of apologetics, not scholarship. Let's take a look at Ashman. I, I'm going to skip heavily. I apologize. Gee declares that the discoveries give students of the Book of Abraham new evidence to evaluate. Woohoo! Oh, boy, that thrilled me as an apologist, man. I am not kidding. So, Joseph Smith was not the only one to associate the name Abraham with a lion couch and a hypocephalus, the round picture in the book of Abraham. Joseph Smith was not the first to do this. This was done in antiquity. This is John Gee claiming this. The documentation he provides as evidence of this extraordinary assertion comes from magical papyri, which Guy, in his first article, did not actually inform anybody about. This lion couch right here. When I found out where Guy got this idea of Abraham on a lion couch with Abraham's name right there under that lion couch where Anubis is going to sacrifice Abraham and it's identified as Abraham. When I found that out in the Greek magical papyri, you dang spitting tootin' right, baby. I went and got the text myself. This is too good not to have. Bets, the Greek magical papyri in translation, authentic, scholarly, linguistic, iconographic evidence in favor of Joseph Smith. And you dang right, I turned to Janet Johnson's article that John Gee was translating and sharing with us the evidence showing that Joseph Smith got it right. Whoops, I almost spit on the camera. <laughs> Woo! That's what you get for being excited. I was all over this. This was hot stuff, baby. Yeah. Yeah, man. So here's John Gee's claim. Very important. <sighs> He says this vignette is roughly close to Joseph Smith's facsimile number one. It's Abraham on the lion couch with his name under the lion couch. Come on, what more do you want, critics? Open your minds, open your eyes, you idiots. You're losing the war. We have absolute archaeological proof right there. Look at it and weep right there. Abraham on the lion couch identified. Take that. 
<laughs> well, so what this happens is this turns out to be a Greek magical spell immediately below the vignette. The words, these right here, see this all the way across. Well, the whole article in the magical papyri that Janet Johnson translated, and she is a very good demotic Greek scholar. Janet Johnson is the one that translated this particular article, which John Gee is describing and discussing in his fantastical scholarship. Yeah, baby. Go, John, go, baby. We're with you, brother. Yeah. Well, it turns out to be a Greek magical spell. And it utilizes textual material from another Greek magical spell, which Gee states comes from the next to the last column of this papyrus to suggest that the scene refers to the sacrifice of Abraham on a lion couch. <laughs> Read it and weep, critics. We got you, baby. We win. And this authenticates Joseph Smith's interpretation of facsimile number one of the book of Abraham. Yeah, we bad, we bad. Well, here's the situation. Do these papyri actually mention Abraham in the manner that Guy averts? That is, do they connect him with representations similar to facsimile number one and two of the book of Abraham? Is the lion couch vignette of 384.1, they've, they've numbered it, is that vignette right there? The question is, is this lion couch vignette a depiction of Abraham as a human sacrifice? And does the text from the previous or any other column of that papyrus refer to that sacrifice? Is the hypocephalus connected with this? And is it true, as John Gee says, that hypocephali are a revelation about the heavens and the cosmos. Is this how to obtain revelation? Is through a hypocephali? Because that's what John Gee claims, right? So that's the question we're asking. And we want to explore this and look at this. And was Abraham about to be sacrificed on an altar uh, by Pharaoh's priest, as John Gee averse once again. And so we want to look at this. As it turns out, the information that Gee gives us, and there's, there's another, this is how farms reproduced the lion couch right there. As, as Gee gave us this information, uh, he is misleading. The attempted sacrifice of the person on the lion couch uh, was not an actual attempted sacrifice. The fire, the, the intonation to the deity of asking for help, etc. What Guy did is he took a splice. This is going to start sounding familiar. He took a splice of one piece of papyri comment, and he took it over here, and he put it together with this one so that it made it look like the person on the lion couch was praying to God for help, for deliverance, because he was about to be sacrificed, right? Well, as it turns out, Ashman finds that contrary to Gee, the text of the spell cannot authenticate the historicity of the book of Abraham because it has nothing to do with human sacrifice of a victim on a lion couch that is about to be killed by a jackal-headed god. 
drats. You mean Guy didn't know what the hell he was talking about? No, it's worse than that. Guy manipulates the historical evidence in order to get information that the evidence does not lead us to. And that's vastly worse than being ignorant. That is being too clever. Sucks to be you, John Gee. Just in case you ever watch this, which I doubt you'll man up and do, but you know, you never know. You might. The name Abraham is actually in the middle of an abracadabra spell. The words down here at the bottom here. Abraham is simply a name invoked among many dozens of a magic spell. And it's actually not a man on the lion couch. Ashman shows how Janet Johnson and others, Betts and so on and so forth, the scholarship, the proper scholarship of the Greek magical papyri described that that is a woman on the lion couch. And the name Abraham is invoked with at least five or six other magical names. And the idea is that this is a love charm. Someone wants this big-breasted woman to spread her legs for him so that he can get laid. And John Gee manipulates this to be a sacrifice of Abraham, with Abraham praying for deliverance? Seriously? Seriously. There's absolutely no possible context of Abraham being sacrificed on the lion couch. John Gee has had to change, manipulate, put together stuff to make it authenticate Joseph Smith's Book of Abraham, facsimile number one. And it's all just fart in the wind. Yeah. Does it get worse than this? Yeah, it really does. I mean, that's bad enough, right? Let's see what John Gee says. He claims there are six Egyptological texts that confirm Joseph Smith. Ed Ashman, after he's done, demonstrates that exactly none of them, zero, confirm Joseph Smith. Oh, for six is how bad John Gee bungled this, man. That's brutal. That is so brutal. But here's the thing. John Gee says, I'm going to skip here. Yeah, it's not about conjuring up divinity to save the man on the lion couch. The magic words Abraham included is a conjuration for the deity to get the woman horny enough to make love to the guy. That's what this is about. But the idea of the connection with the hypocephalus, John Gee manipulates it so that he says the hypocephalus is mentioned as the apple of Abraham's eye. Abraham is the apple of God's eye and that the uh, the hypocephalus is verified as a wedge out eye. And Abraham is tied to the wedge out eye. Therefore, there is a connection between Abraham and the hypocephalus. All of that is just a complete misuse of the actual papyri and the meanings of the words in the Coptic which Ed Ashman gives. It's not even necessarily a connection with the biblical Abraham, which is amazing. Yes, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is mentioned and all, but that's not confirming them as valid historical people. These magicians in Egypt by this time, 1 to 200 BC, didn't have a clue who Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was. They didn't care because they were pulling information from all areas and using it to produce 
magic power over other people. That's what they were doing. The name Abraham was popular in spells, but not because it was confirming ancient Judaism. Not at all. So, and he talks about here the significance of the Abraham concept. The lion couch does not depict a human sacrifice. There is no plea for deliverance, as John Gee claimed, the sacrificial victim. And then John Gee says the Book of the Dead, chapters 162 through 167, these have nothing to do with hypocephaly like John Gee claimed they did. He's just manipulating and stretching the evidence in his scholarship. And that sucks, John Gee. You're not impressing me. And your dang sure didn't get away with it either. So see, in a way, John Gee is insulting all of his Mormon audience because, of course, they're not smart enough to check into this themselves. I wasn't as an apologist. The first thing I did is rejoice, get down on my knees, say thank you to Heavenly Father for John Gee and his fabulous scholarship. Thank you con for confirming Joseph Smith's translation of the Book of Abraham. Now let me go teach on the internet. And I went to the internet. And none of it turned out. None of it is valid or actual. Well, that's enough to kind of bother you if you stop and think about it. To establish the historicity of the book of Abraham, it was designed to magically empower an iron ring, this spell that John Gee says is associated with the book of Abraham. It is designed to cause praise for the petitioner. For Gee, Abraham, the name, the word, A-B-R-A-C-A-M, Abraham, must refer to the patriarch Abraham and the white stone that is described in the magical Greek text must be a seer stone. Duh, you critics. And then Gee draws attention to three scriptural items discussing the magical seer stone. Revelation 2.17, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knows, save he that receiveth it. D&C 130, 10 through 11. Then the white stone mentioned in Revelation 2, 17, will become a Urim and Thummim to each individual who receives one, whereby things pertaining to a higher order of kingdoms will be made known. The new name is the key word. And then Abraham 3, 1. And I, Abraham, had the Urim and Thummim, which the Lord my God had given unto me in Ur of the Chaldees, and the Lord said unto me, by the Urim and Thummim. John Gee referred to these texts to support the white stone idea in the magical papyri, which was associated with Abraham. See how it all fits in? This is authentic totally to Joseph Smith. It's not. Nothing in the spell indicates that the white grape-shaped stone is an analog to a seer stone, a medium through which revelation is to be obtained. Even more unfortunate for Gee's interpretation, the white stone of Revelation 2.17, on which D&C 130 as a pesher is built, even the stone in Revelation was in the seer stone. According to the best of biblical scholarship, it was an amulet. In religious history, the amulet has a place in the magical beliefs of the time. Magical formulae, in this case, the new name, is part of the magical formula, mediate supernatural powers and offer protection against demons and evil forces. Had nothing to do with translating ancient records. None of that. Had nothing to do with giving you extra special hidden knowledge. None of that. That's all just bogus. So, seeing the stone as a seer stone is truly unwarranted. It's a magically potent word that has no authenticating significance for the book of Abraham. 
The other thing he does is he skips several of the ancient magical names that were invoked seven times in a seven-time formula, and he eliminates all the magical names, and he only uses the Jewish deities' names in his analysis. Again, he's only selecting and choosing what suits his purpose. In this case, because he wants Abraham to be seen as invoking his God, the Jewish God, he leaves out the names of Zeus and Achamathamachomodemon or whatever other magical names all strewn together. He eliminates all that stuff so that it looks like an authentic Jewish prayer. And it's nothing of the sort in this magical papyri. It's all bunk. So, it wasn't a prayer to Yahweh. It wasn't a prayer to the deity. It was a prayer to the supreme intelligence, something that Guy manipulated so that his readers did not realize that. So, my whole point in this, and then Carrie Moolstein after Ashman blew away John Gee, Carrie Molstein repeated this information. Hey, we have an authentic magical papyri lion couch with Abraham on it, and he's being sacrificed, and he's calling on God to deliver him, and the angel of the Lord is showing up and helping him out, just like Joseph Smith said in the book of Abraham. Carrie Molstein just simply stupidly bobbed off of John Gee's idea. He didn't even bother to check into it himself. He just said, hey, man, that sounds cool enough. I think I'll tell my audience that. And so he went ahead and did it. Molstein did have to come back a year or two years later and admit that it was a woman and a love charm, not a man being sacrificed on that lion couch, right? Well, Guy admitted that in his second article, but then he said, well, the woman can be seen as one of the three virgin sacrifices in the book of Abraham. That is how bloody desperate John Guy is to find anything at all he can to authenticate the book of Abraham text. He makes stuff up, which is just asinine because that isn't the context either. But you see, they've got to find some way to verify Joseph Smith. <laughs> it's mind-boggling that mature grown-up scholars think they have to manipulate the historical evidence. The sad thing is, that's the only way they can get Joseph Smith's translation authenticated. authenticated. The actual evidence doesn't do that. This is why we have so many wild, crazy, harebrained theories floating around there by the dozens now of the Mormon apologists who are trying desperately to come up with anything. So I want to read you this yeah, it's to inflame the passion of the woman is the real point. The magical papyri has no such stated purpose as Joseph Smith's explanation of the hypocephalus in the book of Abraham as obtaining revelation about the heavens and the cosmos. No, that's not it. Sorry, John, strike 275. And then he goes on. I'm going to read you the final. I'm going to just skip to this because I want to get to some other materials here. Uh, yeah, it was Jewish magic that was going on back then as well. So although he declares that faith is the real proof of Scripture, John Gee paradoxically has gone to great lengths in his articles to develop evidence out of Christian era magic spells from Egypt in an effort to authenticate the historicity of the book of Abraham. Unfortunately, none of the six authenticating references he has preserved is historically rigorous. Guy provides his own dramatic demonstration of that when he abandons the extraordinary claim that he makes in his first article that he actually has a reference suggesting Abraham lying on a lion couch, altar, calling on God, and he boldly declares 
that it compares closely with Joseph Smith's indication that facsimile one from the book of Abraham is the illustration of Abraham fastened upon an altar to be sacrificed by idolatrous priests. After the review of his first piece pointed out that the evidence indicated clearly that the person on the line couch was a woman who was the object of a love spell, Gee abandons his remarkable claim. And then he admits in his second article that the person on the line couch was a woman and that she was the object of a love spell. Only now he claims that she was to be sacrificed <laughs> on the lion couch if she would not yield to her suitor, according to an old Egyptian formula, is how Guy put it. Pfft, bunk. The spell no longer is evidence of Abraham on the altar. Now it is evidence for three young virgins on the altar. Manipulative bullshit is what this is. Less dramatic but no less significant is the fact that Guy has, as the reviews have shown, misquoted and misinterpreted the data and the sources in order to develop his authenticating evidences. And the reason I wanted to share it, now this was back in the 1990s, I agree. Hey, that's old stuff, backyard professor. I get all that. What I want to point out is that the apologetic mindset with John Gee began before he got his PhD. And he has never lost that, ever. Not ever. He's had that mindset the whole time. Now, the remarkable thing that is so shocking is this mindset has caused John Gee to come up with various ad hoc excuses to justify Joseph Smith instead of accepting the plain fact that the evidence leads to. And... Once he acquired his PhD, he just let her rip. Every single interpretation, every single theory that John Gee has proposed involving, say, the Book of Abraham and its authenticity using ancient parallels or the uh, Egyptian alphabet and grammar and its relationship to the Egyptian alphabet and those relationships with the Book of Abraham translation folio, with the figures of the hieroglyphs in the margins, or whatever John Gee has proposed, his reverse translation theory, his two inks theory, his theory that the Characters were added in the margins after the Book of Abraham text was written down. It doesn't matter, and is most infamous, the famous missing role theory that was destroyed by Smith and Cook mathematically. Nothing of John Gee's scholarship in the last 35 years has actually panned out into acceptance of the actual evidence and nature and status of the Book of Abraham or the Joseph Smith papyri, etc. None of it. Nothing John Gee has ever proposed is totally accepted. None of the world of Egyptology Accepts that. Now, in his interview with Scott Gordon in Fair just a little while ago, I guess a few months back, he mentioned, well, I, I published 150 scholarly articles. Who gives a flip? His newest attempt at what? Finding authenticity with the Book of Abraham was just this Friday, two days ago, in Dan Peterson's interpreter. Mormons can't get their tripe apologetic defense published in actual, realistic, true, scholarly venues. So they have to invent their own paper 
their own journals in order for them to even publish anything when it comes to Joseph Smith and the scriptures, right? So John Gee, just two days ago, published another article demonstrating that the anachronism of chariots in the book of Abraham does not refute it, but it is an authentic item. Yahoo! And in the process, he says, you know, the critics' problems is they don't take the book of Abraham seriously. You critics, you need to take the book of Abraham seriously. Okay, once again, I've said this quite a few times. I suspect I'll be saying it quite a few more times, but uh, you Mormon apologists, when are you going to wake up to a very cold, hard fact? We don't give a flip about the book of Abraham. The book of Abraham is not what's on trial. Joseph Smith is. The only issue that matters to anybody, sincerely, I'm, ju I'm just stating this out open, honest, is did Joseph Smith translate the papyri correctly? Is Joseph Smith a valid translator of ancient languages? That's all we care about. That's all that really matters. If he can clear that hurdle, then we'll look at his scripture. But we're not going to look at his scripture before we see if it's valid or not by his method. Nibley got it wrong. And you guys following Nibley get it wrong. Method does matter. And I'm telling you what, the uh, one of the best new texts to come out demonstrating that is my good friend Dan Bogle, Book of Abraham Apologetics. You got to read this book, you guys. Uh, method matters. It's serious. It's real for true. Um, Nibley was just completely out of his league because, of course, he knew the problem. He knew the problem. The translation doesn't match. That's the issue. So anyway, okay, so uh, I'm going to, hey, Mike West, that's basically essentially, uh, well, I mean, technically speaking, it's not. Uh, Robert Rittner, again, and this was John Gee's uh, chair for his PhD. The Joseph Smith Egyptian Papyri, a complete edition. In page after, now I don't know if you've read this or not, but in page after page after page, and what I've done is I've yellowed it and I've turned down the pages, and you can see that I've got lots and lots of pages turned down where Rittner describes the problem with the scholarship in the Egyptology of John Gee, Michael Dennis Rhodes, and Kerry Mulstein. Right? All three of them. And he says how time and again, they are mistranslating. They are misusing. Michael Dennis Rhodes actually plagiarized Rittner. Rittner had a specific type of text and a specific type of way of translating that. Rhodes took that translation and, and pretended it was his own. Now, that's pretty bad. I mean... How stupid do you have to get to plagiarize the Western Hemisphere's greatest Egyptologist and think you're going to get away with it? I, I Come on, you idiot Mormon scholars. Do some valid scholarship, man. I'm not trying to ad hominem you, but holy nightmare. Plagiarized Robert Rittner? Oh. <sighs> I, wow. <laughs> That's unreal. Uh, yeah, he, he talked. I'm, I'm not going to go through all this right now. I don't need to. If, if you, if you really want me to, I will in another video, but, um, Rittner just basically eviscerates them all. Now, the update, now this was uh, 2014, 2015. Rittner did several articles. He also responded to the Mormon Church's essay on the website on the Book of Abraham and the translation. Rittner responded to that also. And uh, the updated 
This is 2014, 2015. The updated, new, up-to-date information because since Rittner's day, which no apologist has actually ever refuted, uh, John D. ran with his tail cut between his legs, of course. Kerry Mulstein is, has basically kind of sort of tickled some of the Rittner ideas, but he's gone off into other areas too. But now the updating for the current level of apologetic scholarship is Dan Vogel's book. Um, he, he, the new theories of the reverse translation theory, where the, the argument is that the alphabet and grammar did not come first, but the book of Abraham was translated all in July, 1835. It was completely done by July 1835. And then from the text, William W. Phelps is the one that developed the grammar and the alphabet the most. And then everybody else was copying him. The grammar and alphabet came after the book of Abraham. Well, <laughs> Dan Fogel just wipes that out. <laughs> he, he, no. See, the appearance here is that the further along we go in this subject, the more desperate the arguments and the excuses get of the apologists to where they are coming up with some of the dumbest theories that we have ever seen. They have to, and Vogel shows this, no joke, they have to keep manipulating the data. They have to misinterpret the thing. The thing I find here, I'm not, wow. And I know Ryan Larson has some meditations on Dan Vogel, and I am reading that, and I will discuss that with Dan, Ryan Larson and with Dan Vogel, and perhaps we'll do some videos of this also. But uh, the way that the current uh, level of Mormon apologetics with Kerry Moulstein, uh, how they either manipulate or ignore the official history of Joseph Smith. It just blows your mind. You go, wow. You know, it's like I've said, you know, the, the Anna Mormon uh, guy that I used to argue with all the time when I called him and let him know, hey, I'm no longer an apologist, when he told me, you know how we always blew you out of the water, don't you? I go, no. And he goes, we always quoted Joseph Smith back at you. Well, that's what Dan Vogel's doing. The own apologists of the Mormon church no longer accept what Joseph Smith himself said, let alone Oliver Cowdery or William W. Phelps or Willard Richards. They don't even believe the early Mormon church leadership in the official church history. They're making stuff up to fit their theory in order to save Joseph Smith. They're manipulating Joseph Smith so that he didn't really say or mean what is written. He, he meant this because this fits our theory. I mean, how naked but stupid kind of scholarship can you guys keep trying to produce in order to save Joseph Smith from himself? It is mind-boggling. I mean, if, if it wasn't so serious, it'd be absolutely... This stuff belongs on Saturday Night Live. I am so not kidding. <sighs> so anyway, that, that's essentially what I wanted to get to, is, is just, uh, just to say there's a lot there's a lot more information. Now, now I am going to say this too, and... Uh, Really, truly, seriously, uh, Bill Real and Radio Free Mormon on the Mormonism Live, uh, I believe April 6th, this April 6th, just a couple weeks from now, they are going to have Dan Vogel and Brent Metcalf back, and they are going to begin discussing a lot of this uh, material. Um, 
that is really, really going to be fantastic. I, I hope they do a series on it. Uh, hopefully it'll jive with a little bit of what I'm sharing with you from the amateur end of this, but I'm a well-read amateur. I'm well enough read to know that the, uh, the Mormon apologetics can't bullshit their way past me anymore. I, I can see through the smoke screen, man. They're, See, here's the complaint. Here's here's what they're saying. They say, hey, this issue is so much more complicated, you know. Um, th this is so difficult that if you try to simplify it, then you're 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 doing something wrong. No, it's very, very simple from this side. The evidence shows Joseph Smith didn't get the translation of the papyri right. How long did that take me to tell you that? Ten seconds? It is the apologists who can't accept what the evidence says who are complicating the picture, and then they are beginning to say, see, now you need a PhD and this and that and thus and so, and you have to analyze this and that and this and this, and you have to start putting together the proper historical connections. And we are, we are so gosh damn bloody confused that we don't know what the hell to do. It's the Mormons that are confused. They're the ones making it so complicated that you can't see straight. That's not our problem. That's why we keep telling them, you guys, we don't care about the book of Abraham at this point. No, that's, not, that's a red herring. That's irrelevant to us. We care about Joseph Smith. He's the one we're testing. That's how this works. So anyway, that's basically what I wanted to cover tonight. Uh, I've been an hour and a half, oh, 24 likes. Thank you. You guys are too kind. I haven't even looked at the, uh, I hope, I hope uh, you've all, oh, Mike West. Welcome. Vega Dog. Good to see you here. Patty Cake. Yeah. Mosia. Good to see you. Dan Vogel. Yeah. Uh, who else is here? Doug Vincent, Mike White. T.O., thank you for showing up. I know Ryan Larson said he was here earlier. Um, I, I haven't paid attention to the chat because I really wanted to get this information across of why, unfortunately, I just no longer trust the Mormon apologetic scholarship at this point until they can begin to show me some credibility. Now, of course, th they don't give a dang about me or you, anybody of you in my audience, because we're not their target audience. You know, they have the uh, the TBM Mormons who are going to believe no matter what. And so anything a Mormon scholar says, they just automatically fall in line and say, well, see, that's the truth. Well, I can tell you right now, that's how I was uh, as an apologist. And I wasn't doing it right. So I know the TBMs aren't. I mean, I hate to break you the bad news, but you're not doing it right. You can't possibly be doing it right by simply accepting their argument. You must look at the evidence yourself. If they're telling you not to look at the evidence yourself, then you're being cheated. And my advice is you better do something about it. You're going to lose a lot of years on your life if you don't. It'll be a great experience, but you're uh, you're going to end up being a little bit angry, I suspect. That would be my supposition. So anyway, oh, Paul Osborne, yes, good to see you, my friend. Uh, anyway, um, I'll talk to you for a few minutes in the chat. I'm, I'm not going to have any of the context, but uh, yeah, April 6th, I think, is when they're going to be showing up. Huff Daddy, good to see you here too. Trevor Luke. Hey, Trevor Luke. Always love having you here. Uh, good man, Tim Rathbone. Mike Langley, good to see you. Yes, April 6th, we'll be prepared. Yeah, Dan Vogel. I have no doubt you'll be prepared. Dude, you blow me. Oh, that's what else I wanted to say real quick. Uh, I know, this seems like I'm always, I'm always touting Mormonism Live and Bill Real and Radio Free Mormon and Brent Metcalf and Dan Vogel. That's because these guys are producing the real turkey and gravy. This is the steak. But I, I am here to tell you something. Seriously, man. Dan Vogel's video series on the book of Abraham. I th what is it? Eight parts, Dan? <laughs> At least I've seen eight parts. 
they are fabulous. Now, and, and his book, his book follows after the video series, but the book really adds a lot to our, you got to get the book, man. You got to get the book and read it. So look, YouTube is fantastic because it's giving us so many more resources to draw upon. Now, don't ignore, now see Fair Mormon, uh, Tim Barker, Tim Barker has a very exquisite concept, the flaw in Tim Barker's presentation, 2020 fair. I would encourage you to watch that video, you guys, seriously. But the problem with it is he had to uh, misuse Caswell's witness, his testimony, his description of what he knew. And based on that, it completely eliminates Tim Barker's interpretation, in my opinion. Now, he might differ. I'm more than open to talking with him about it if he wants to. Quentin Barney, now you understand Quentin Barney now, his master's thesis on all of the book of breathings. Yeah. You know, Kerry Moolstein still making a whoop de do about, well, some illustrations don't match the text, etc. That has nothing to do with this one. This one that we have, that we know, that we have used, and that we understand, this one, the illustration, does have to do with the text. That's obvious. So, I mean, just because others don't doesn't mean all of them don't. So see that even that's just kind of a, a silly, kind of a weak argument in my opinion. So, uh, but I, if you don't like videos, if you like to read, you've got access to Dan Vogel's concepts and, and if you do like the videos, then you have access to Dan Vogel's concepts. If you don't like to read, you can get it either way. I like both. But anyway, so a beanie for that. Oh, yeah, 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 whatever. Anyway, uh, I, I, I'm going to start repeating myself if I keep going. So, uh, yes, eight parts. Yeah, Dan's telling me eight parts. Yeah, the, the video. He also has a video series on the. Uh, uh, Dan Vogel, that is, uh, Joseph Smith's Wives and the Origins of Mormonism. I mean, his videos are really good. Um, I'm probably a little bit too much. Uh, I'm probably a little bit too loose. Dan is more uh, straightforward scholarly. His graphics are sensational. I love how he puts the graphics together, especially with the papyri stuff, because you can virtually see which hieroglyph he's talking about. You can see which folio he's taking his stuff from and all. So that, that's always very helpful. I hope you do that also when you get back on Mormonism Live, Dan. You really, I, I hope so. Tout away, Radio Free Mormon says. All right. Yeah. All right. Up your nose with a rubber hose. Hey, Radio Free Mormon. <laughs> uh, dazed and confused, Paul Osborne. No, you're not. You're you guys are talking about something else. I don't have Mosia. Thank you for the compliment. Appreciate it. It is great to see you too, Trevor. Uh, if you didn't get to see the whole video, you can watch the the rerun. Um, yeah. Yeah, Doug, Doug Vince saying the takedown of Molstein and Gee are epic from Dan Vogel. That's what's inspiring me for tonight's show. I wanted to give you a little bit of uh, different information and different context than Vogel goes to. And so that way we kind of dovetail, but we still see the same overall pattern and method of John Gee and showing that method does matter because manipulating the historical evidence as a method is severely dangerous for valid scholarship. But apparently the Mormon apologists haven't gotten to that point yet. They still think they can cheat like hell and get away with it and confirm testimonies. I, I don't see how that works. I seriously just don't, you know, call me stupid, but I, I don't get it. I don't see how that works. Uh, 
I will be right back. I know, I promised I wouldn't do this on live, but I'll be right back. Don't go away. I'm not done yet. I'm going to talk to you some more. Hold on. All right. Yes, only the backyard professor can get away with stupid crap like that. I had to go pee, all right? Hey, I'm an old man. Only I can get away with saying stuff like that, too, on a live session. So, anyway, whoo doggy, now I'm ready to talk. <laughs> oh, all right. Thank you, you guys. I appreciate it. Hey, Michael Ray. Mike Langley. Yeah, baby. Good to see you. Okay. Oh, lamb chop. Yeah, well, this is just part of my library. I promise it goes all the way around in front of me over to here and all the way across that wall, way over there on the end of that wall, all the way back up to here and all the way across. So I've got at least 16 books. They're pretty good. Oh, you guys suspected that's what I was doing. See, I can't fool you guys. You think, see, the Mormon apologists think they can, though. But if I can't, then they can't, right? <laughs> hey, I have too much fun. I, I, I agree. I'm just myself. I, I'm not going to apologize for it. That's just the way it is. I'm human. What the hell? Here we go. Brothers and sisters all, right? Oh, you know, there's nothing like filtered water. But I'm not going to lie to you. Diet Coke is good, too. Mm. Oh, that's good. Hey, there's still several of you hanging around. So I'm going to keep talking if you guys want to. Oh. <laughs> All right. Your eyes were turning yellow. <laughs> were they? Oh. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> You're lying now, Vogel. You've got to have evidence, pal. Ooh, I guess it'll show up on the video, won't it? <laughs> oh, I love this. You can be a voice actor or even a regular actor, but I was thinking great voice for cartoons. Thank you, Ryan. I, I've actually been told that before by someone else. Um, crap, maybe I maybe I will. Who knows? I could even draw the cartoon. Oh, hi, Deborah. Deborah Kittredge, good to meet you. Good to see you again. David Nielsen, pizza? I didn't get any pizza. Hey, that's an idea. What if I came on eating dinner? Yeah. You remember that one video I did where I was eating a hot dog in the pickup? Oh, my gosh. People just ranted and raved about that. And I just I was just having dinner real quick before I got up in the mountains to do some kind of a video or other or something. I can't remember if it was chess or if it was something on the – Probably something on the Book of Mormon or Book of Abraham. But iced coffee every time. Yeah, the lattes. Those are those are good, man. <laughs> yeah, Trevor. LSD apologetics these days. Sometimes it makes you wonder, man. I I mean, I almost feel sorry for them. But see, that's a dumb thing. They have to know they're manipulating it intentionally that is invalid. Uh, that, they can't possibly believe that's valid. I, come on. There's just no way. I just, I don't, you know, that's the way it goes. <laughs> no, I'm not going pee again, Radio Free Mormon. You go this time. Oh, yeah, that's what he's saying. Okay, Radio Free Mormon will be right back. Yeah, see, don't tell me I don't have any influence. Woohoo! Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh, oh, it 
it was fried chicken. It was too. I've done it with a hot dog too, though, Doug. Yeah, in my truck. Yeah, but I think it was fried chicken. Oh, I love fried chicken. I can't help it. You know, that's why I'm so fat and I've got to start losing weight. Man, I got to get some weight off, man. I'm going to have to start doing that. Okay, Mark Crispin, good to see you again. You're saying fried chicken too. All right, fried chicken it was. I mean, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, I don't doubt it. Uh, fried chicken's one of my favorite. Hey, we've got a store called Brolum's that serves the best fried chicken. Oh, mm, man, it's good. So anyway, yeah, it's the breading that clobbers me, right? I mean, the chicken itself isn't fattening, but the breading, and the breading is so good. Why does everything that tastes so good have to be so bad for you? That's what I want to know. It just torques my britches. Wayman29, thank you for showing up, bro. Way to go. I love you, dude. Yeah, that last guy on your Facebook last week that said he stopped in for 20 minutes and then left because I never got to the point, I changed that up tonight. So send him back. I jumped right on this. Within four minutes, I was talking about the subject, and I just barely shut up. So tell him, hey, I got carried away last time, but this time I did not dawdle. I got right to the point. I shared the good information, and now I'm having a fun chat with all of my friends and my audience. So be sure and tell him that, Wayman. You'll see it when you watch the video. I promise I'm not going to waste the first half hour of your life watching it. So note to yourself, pee before the show. <laughs> yeah, John Uller. That's the dumb thing I did. What a subject to talk about live, right? People people who've never even seen this are going to watch this are going to say, who is this clown, man? What a nerd. All right, yeah. But that is good advice. I mean, hey, after all, you know. You've been to Brolums? Yeah, I love Brolums. I do, really, seriously. Uh, Zanny Banani, welcome. Good to see you. Okay, yeah, chatting is fun. Oh, I'm glad you made it, Wayman. I'm glad you made it. Uh, Wayman29, you guys, look him up on Facebook. He's a potter. And he did us, he did my wife and I some coffee cups, and they are fabulous. I'm serious. I, I'll tell you what, Wayman, next time, God, I'm spitting like crazy all over the place. When I come on to my next live next week, by the way, next week, truly, uh, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be uh, focusing more on Kerry Mulstein and some of his antics, and uh, uh, I, I know Ryan Larson. I, I promise, dude, I'm not ignoring you. I, I'm just I'm getting you in the lineup. I promise. I appreciate you keep showing up for more. Um, I probably bore the tears out of you. I apologize, but uh, Ryan Larson has some good stuff too. But Wayman Twenty Nine, look him up on Facebook. He does pottery and he's good. And you know, I I've not Wayman and I go way back when 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 I was an apologist. He was he was on YouTube and uh, he got a hold of me and we became really good friends and. And uh, all this time, I mean, I, I didn't actually try to convert Wayman, but Wayman didn't try to dissuade me either. But yeah, we were studying biblical texts together and all that. It was a great, it was a great time, wasn't it, Wayman? Yeah, I did all those hundreds and hundreds of videos as an apologist, man. We had a good time. Oh, Heidi Christensen, welcome. Yeah, I didn't see you here either. Anyway. Oh, let's see. Doug is in my mission. Really? You had your mission here, huh? Way to go, Doug. Oh, yeah. The catching up on the CES letter. Yeah. that's See, that's another one I wanted to. I mean, you know, I, I've technically done a video on CES letter, but I didn't go through the, the content. What I did was uh, describe the uh, the response to it, which I thought was extremely flat. Um, it j just didn't impress me. Uh, but man, I'm glad I wasn't the guy at fair behind the scenes trying to defend the book of Abraham against Jeremy Reynolds. 
Oh man, I am so glad that wasn't me, man. I'm glad I was inspired to quit being an apologist before Runnels showed up because <laughs> he just spanked fair. Oh my God. He just destroyed him. That was something else. Uh, that was, that was a hoot. Uh, no, no, Wayman. Uh, I had, I had changed my mind before the CES letter showed up. Um, it showed up. Yeah, it was kind of close to the same time, but yeah, it was, it was just, you know, it wasn't any one thing, but it, the papyri, the book, Abraham the translation, that was definitely the big shelf item. Uh, I, actually it was, uh, Rittner's book was one of the main keys to it without question. And then, uh, uh, Thomas Riscus deconstructing Mormonism. God, that, that book just yanked the rug right out from under me. Poof. I, I just, I realized game over. <laughs> I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to take this one day at a time, you know, but wow something else. Oh yeah, I heard that our friend Bob Crockett died. Rest in peace, my brother. Yeah, Bob Crockett. He was a he was a worthy adversary on our message board and he was a worthy friend on our message board. I was sad to hear he died. Um yeah. Doggone it. But I mean it happens to the best of us. Even all of us. <laughs> So, but you never know. So that's why I say, you know, be good, do well, have fun, make friends, stay happy, and always be good neighbors because you never know, you know, it's better to better to have fun in life and laugh a little bit and learn some cool stuff than, you know, not. So anyway, yeah. Yeah, the C, uh, me too, Heidi. After I read through the, see, I, I had heard about the CS letter for like two years or so before I even bothered to read it because I was still kind of adjusting. And so, yeah, when I finally read it, <laughs> it was just one bombshell after another. And Dan Peterson's response at FAIR just completely miffed me. <laughs> I said, what do you mean you've already answered all of these? You haven't answered them at all. I mean, that just goes to show you that the Mormons, uh, I, and I'm I'm probably doing a fallacy of generalization here. I, I recognize that. But, you know, if, if all they want to say is, oh, well, we've already provided an answer for that. Did that help? No, of course not. What kind of a response is that? You know? Jump into the details with us and let's see if you can hang on with Jeremy Runnels on the details. You know, I mean, he just, he trounced uh, fair on the book of Abraham stuff, let alone the book of Mormon and the witnesses and polygamy. And I mean, everything and all things, right? Well, now that they've moved on to other nuances and details, now Dan Vogel shows up. Now Bill Rill and Radio Free Mormon show up. Now Brent Metcalf gets back involved. Radio Free Mormon stupidly pulled me back into the arena. And now all of you guys are suffering because I'm here blabbing like crazy. And it's RFM's fault. <laughs> I love you, brother. I'm having more fun thanks to you. I'm sure glad you finally talked me into this. <laughs> oh, criminy. Oh, rough stone rolling. Yeah, that was uh that was that was a dandy. It really was. And the see, that's what I mean. The uh the narrative uh had to change, and yet when you get more realistic, the thing that amazed me too about rough stone rolling is all of a sudden everybody's saying, Well, that's an anti-Mormon book. Huh? I mean, that's how badly whitewashed. Things have become, apparently, for people to actually respond and say, that's an anti-Mormon book. It's like those guys who remember the reaction to the essays on the church website when they first posted them. And people were writing to the website 
to the church. And they were saying, hey, Anamormans have hacked your website, man. They're posting Anamormon stuff on there. And it was the essays. It was the historical. I mean, that was hilarious. When you stop and think about the ramifications of Boyd K. Packer's stupid view of whitewashing, which is what? Manipulation of history. It always comes back to bite your ass. That's why I wanted to highlight John Gee, because I know he can do better. The trick is he's under the employee of the church. So he won't be able to do better until he retires so that his income isn't threatened. You know, no. who knows, <laughs> right? You know, do you still believe in God? Chris Pierce, I'm looking. I'm willing to be open. Um, I I don't I don't know. That's a good idea. That's a good question. What are my beliefs now? Yeah. I I ask that uh periodically from time to time, surely. Um, I'm looking for sure. Uh I would like to hope there is more to it. I'm I'm willing to openly say that, sure. Uh, and this is one reason why. Uh, I find it so enjoyable to study the mysteries, the ancient mysteries. The thing is, I keep clobber and Joseph Smith on this translation stuff and the fraudulent nature of it and all that. And yet, seriously, as Trevor Luke here can vouch for me, there is an esoteric aspect to this that is also extremely fascinating and and i can't stop looking at that so you know you say yeah you're getting wishy-washy you know well yeah call it whatever you want but i like i like the idea i think that uh my i'll put it this way my literalistic uh, interpretation, maybe my literalistic understanding of stuff. I was probably overdoing it, but I really had no choice because if you want to be a TBM, even today, they're still pretty cockeyed literalistic, right? You know, they hate the idea of the narrative of the Book of Mormon being inspired fiction and stuff. No, 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 no. It's got to be real ancient history. The Book of Mormon, the Book of Abraham authenticity has to be because it's authentic historically. So you see, there's still that literal uh, kind of thinking. Well, I don't know. See, the literal history stuff, and I hate to say it this way, maybe it's because I'm not a genuine historian and I should be, but that to me doesn't carry near the excitement, the idea of a spirituality. And you say, you're screaming at Joseph Smith for evidence. Can you have any evidence of spirituality? At this point, not physically, no. But it's something we all crave for, at least based on what I'm thinking and how I interact with people and through time. Uh, we all, and if you don't, it's cool. It's no big deal. I'm not going to try to convince you or convert you to trying to think this way either. I don't care. I love you just the way you are, you know. Mr. Rogers, yes, I like you just the way you are. But I like the idea of being on a quest for a more full, maybe more fulfilling spiritual life. You know what I mean? I, I don't know how else to say it. I don't, I don't, what other word could we use besides uh, spiritual? I don't know. I don't know. I guess we'll find out, won't we? So, yeah, Lamb Chop, David McAvoy is, is uh, profound, isn't he? I really loved that interview with uh, Bill Real and Radio Free Mormon, Mormonism Live, just a couple weeks ago. Uh, that was epic. That was good. That was good stuff. Now, Bakavoy is good people. I love that guy. You can tell him I said that next time you talk to him. I wish I could get a hold of him more. I'd love to have him on the show. He's good. Oh, anyway.
Oh, Wayman, quit. Okay, tell me more. No, I'm not a hero. I'm a hero on a journey, maybe, but I'm not on a mission. Uh, maybe my mission, yeah, maybe that's not true either. I I, I come out of a, uh, a context, and, you know, the brainwashing is an offensive label, right? Uh, it doesn't matter what religion you are. When you hear, yeah, I was brainwashed, and now you're brainwashed, that kind of gets people a little upset. So, uh how would you put it? Um, instead of being brainwashed, uh, being manipulated. I, I don't know if that's a, any better. I really don't know. <laughs> and in a way, it doesn't matter. My idea now is just, uh, look, I'm in my 60s now. I'm in my sixth decade, and every decade has gotten better. And I love that. And I've deliberately crafted my life that way so that it would do that. I told myself every decade I get better and better. And then you get into the gooey, sticky crap. Well, how do you define better, right? Well, yeah, who knows? <laughs> but I do. But every decade gets better. But, you know, when you get to be your 60s, you start realizing, hey, I haven't quite had enough fun yet. Uh, I really don't quite yet know enough. Um, I haven't made enough videos yet. I haven't made enough friends yet. The enemies I've made, I would really like to make up with and say, hey, I'm not your enemy anymore. I have no reason to be enemies, right? It kind of changes your perception, kind of changes your uh, your attitude a little bit. And, you know, I'm, I'm 61. I'm liking this. I've been in my 60s now for two years, and I'm I'm liking it. So, see, it's getting better. I'm not I'm not disgusted or miserable or looking back at my life lamenting about all my wasted time. Technically speaking, you know, <laughs> there is no waste of time. Hey, if the East has it right and there's reincarnation, you can't have all the cotton picking possible experiences in just one mere 75 year average lifetime anyway. If reincarnation is real and possible and you can come back millions of times and be something and someone different every time and have total experiences, you know what? In some ways, to me, Crap, that actually kind of makes sense in some respects. And I don't care if it's true doctrine or not. That's, I'm just, I'm an explorer. That's what makes it fun. I'm exploring new approaches, new contexts, trying out new things every now and then, you know. You know, just like when I was a teenager, my buddy come over and he had a skateboard. He goes, hey, dude. Yeah, the try skateboarding. Yeah, all right. I did. When I was 45, I picked up snowboarding. Yeah, I snowboarded for three years. I was the old man up on the ski hill. And uh, my third year, I got to where I could surpass the youngsters, some of them. <laughs> so, I mean, in my 60s, what am I going to do that's new? You know, start working off my bucket list. Oh, well, that's probably true, Patty Cake. I guess I am on the mission to be enlightened. Yeah, yeah. Clarify all the hogwash. Yeah, that's true too, Doug. That's true. And yet in some respects, man, I I may be the one putting out some hogwash. I don't know yet. That's what's so fun about having all you guys to discuss this back and forth with, right? Yeah, work through the stuff. Oh, well, thank you. 90 is the new 60. Nice. I'll go with that. Just wait when your hair falls out. Ooh! Actually, I've got my mom's jeans and my mom's hair. Uh, I don't think I'll lose it. Yeah, it's turning kind of gray, though, isn't it? Almost white. It's supposed to make me look distinguished. Now, if I could only act that way. <laughs> then I'd bore you to tears and none of you'd show up. So that's just the way this works. You're just going to have to put up with my shenanigans. <laughs> oh, thank you, Wayman. Thank you. That means a lot to me. There you go, Mo. Hey, that's a good way to look at it, actually. This is my 62nd mortal probation. <laughs> You're on a roll. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. 
Paul Osborne, you believe in reincarnation. You know, when you really stop and think about it, uh, I'm serious. It actually kind of makes sense in so many respects. You know, when the church says, oh, no, you only get one chance. And if you blow it, it's over for eternity. That I, you know, Call me dance, I guess. I don't know. That just doesn't seem to make sense to me. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, that's I agree, Lamb Chop. We old farts need to stay together. Absolutely stick togetherness. Abs what we need to do is somehow find a way to all plan to get together and have a barbecue. Yeah, baby. Or else we can do some meat smoking in our smokers. I do a wicked bratwurst, man. Cheese stuffed bacon wrap bratwurst. Ooh, that's my favorite recipe. Although I do a pretty good beef jerky also. I really do. I smoke a decent beef jerky. I've had a lot of people say the beef jerky is really good. I would even challenge my beloved friend, David Bacaboy to a smoking contest. Yeah. Tell him backyard professors looking for a competition with the great David, my buddy, Bacaboy. I'll take you on the smoking contest. Wouldn't that be fun to do? And then we could all get together and have an eat off. Wouldn't that not be a blast? We got to somehow find a way, man. I think that would be so stinking cool. Oh. Yeah, Mike, a cookout, a backyard professor cookout. Hey, we can even make a video or else do a live session of it. That'd make everybody else jealous, wouldn't it? Can you imagine seeing 60 or 70 of us idiots running around yelling and screaming and hollering, having good food and squirting each other with mustard and having a food fight? Oh, wouldn't that be a hoot? <laughs> food fight, but I'm going to open my mouth so that when you throw it at me, I can taste it. Yeah, totally down with it, Mo. Me too. I do too, dog. I love barbecue. What are three books I need to write, read right now, Wayman29? Three books. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in the situation where I've got I've got uh, yeah, I, I'm in some detailed stuff. Some detailed stuff. But Wayman, hold on. Dennis McDonald's, the Gospels and Homer. Since you like the Bible, the New Testament stuff, this is good shit. I'm serious. This is great stuff. Anything by Dennis McDonald. Dennis McDonald, the Gospels and Homer. You'll love that one, Wayman. What do I think of Ed Decker? Uh, you know what? I never actually really paid much attention to him as an apologist, and I haven't since I've stopped being. So I, I don't know. I, I don't know that. I don't know enough about him to you know, technically comment. Sorry. I hope that didn't disappoint you. Shrimp jerky. Ooh, patty cake. That sounds delicious. That might be fun. Riddle me this. Where does Carrie Shirts hold a barbecue? Radio Free Mormon. I was thinking of flying up your way and doing it in your own backyard. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. We'll have to plan where. That would be kind of fun, wouldn't it? Maybe we could find a meeting spot like in between us both, like Bill Reel's house. And we don't tell him. We all just show up. Yeah. He would love that, wouldn't he? <laughs> Surprise the heck out of him. We can't show up too early or too late, you know. Yeah, 500 people. I think that'd be a hoot. Kind of like uh, John DeLynn's Thrive. We could call it the BYP BBQ, the Backyard Professor Barbecue. Hey, we could make this happen. That might be kind of interesting, huh? Anyway, my problem is I've got to lose weight, you guys. Here I am talking about cramming myself full of food and all that jazz. Crap, I have 50 pounds I got to lose, you know? I'm never going to make it to 75 if I don't get some of my weight off. Mustard fights. Aren't those fun? I've only had one, and it was absolute hilarious. It was so much fun doing it. A... 
Chris Pierce, 62, when your shelf started to break. Good on you. At least it started to break, right? Very good. Oh, Mark, that's very kind of you to say. Thank you. BYP BBQ. Yeah. Hey, that'd make a good t shirt, wouldn't it? Everybody would ask, what do those letters mean? <laughs> you could tell them, ah, oh, friend sent it to me. <laughs> hey, maybe we ought to do that in the in Bill Reel's uh uh merchandise stuff. I have a picture of my funny, ugly looking mug where I'm oh, I know I could be holding a bratwurst, taking a bite out of it. Ah, right? Uh, we could do that on a t-shirt, RFM. BYP BBQ. Hey, that's an idea. I might have to take some pictures of that. That'd be fun. Yeah, there you go. BYOB BYP. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Barbecue a salad? I never thought of that. That might be interesting. Barbecue sauce on a salad? That might be interesting, yeah. City Rock State Park. Hey, Huff Daddy. City Rock State Park's a beautiful place. That's actually a good idea. That, that might work. That might work. Yeah. I know, Vega Dog. But we're trying to be crisp and clean, you know. Easy on the jokes. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. I love it here with you guys. That's why I keep coming back for more lives. I'm so glad some of you decided you liked listening to me live. It's so fun to get to know all you guys and uh, share ideas with you and gab at you and laugh and cry and all that stuff. It's it's awesome, man. Oh, June, no, too early for me. Um, my wife is very COVID sensitive. Um, and so we have to be truly careful. And I know I am so sick of this COVID crap myself. I understand that, but it'll kill her if she catches it. So I'm not going to take any chances. So I have to be careful too. So I have no idea when it'll ever really pass. So yeah, we've literally been hibernating for like two and a half years. So I've got to be a little careful. So I probably couldn't do it in June. And I know you think, well, that's forever. Next year, I hope sincerely, really for real, truly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I have to, Mo. Thank you for that. But yeah, I, you know, it's just one of those things. It's not because I'm a Republican or a Democrat or a Libertarian or a Mormon or a non-Mormon or an anti-Mormon or a Mormon apologist or a scholar. It has nothing to do with that. It's just that we are so susceptible and the doctor's advice is you really need to be serious about it. And it just keeps morphing. You know, there's nothing you can do about it except hide, <laughs> more or less. I'm very fortunate that I have a job that I don't have to be around a lot of people a lot. I am very fortunate for that reason. I can still get most of my work done. So that's good. I don't sit in an office in a cubicle surrounded with 20 other people. Thank the good Lord. But yeah, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah, Dan Vogel, you know what I'm saying, don't you? Yeah, yeah, it's got to be safe. Yep, yep. We all reap the benefits. My my happy day, Chris Pierce. I love doing research. I benefit from the research of so many of you excellent people in the audience, too. I mean, we're all just kind of bouncing off each other. And we, isn't it fascinating that we can talk about the same dadgum subject seriously? Uh, and yet every one of us have uh, another uh, angle, another view, another piece of information. You know, you think, well, we've exhausted this subject. And then all of a sudden, John Gee comes up with another idiotic interpreter article and we get to start all over. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, he literally did a new interpreter article Friday on how chariot is not an anachronism. And it supports the authenticity of the book of Abraham. And he goes way off into this. Critics don't 
pay attention to the book of Abraham enough. If we took it seriously, we would see that it's authentic. And he goes off into the ancient Hurrian and the ancient old Babylonian. And he's quoting different French articles. I mean, it's got every kind of apologetic hallmark of scholarship. And it doesn't mean a damn thing. It's all just fluff in the wind, man. You go, really? I mean, every time John Gee starts pontificating on a subject and he goes on for 35 pages, like he did in his review of Ed Ashman, Abracadabra, Isaac and Jacob, when he's trying to make a big historical point or like his, his article in the, uh, in the uh, Astronomy, Papyrus, and Covenant when he's talking about every time John Gee does this, you know he's he's BSing you. The facsimile three in the Book of the Dead 125. This whole article is a complete snow job trying to show us how none of us know all about facsimile number three because we don't have PhDs and we're not studying it seriously like John Gee is. And therefore, you're out of date, you critics. You need to learn what facsimile number three is all about. And when you're really getting brass tacks, you go, I don't even care what facsimile three is. <laughs> And you're wrong, Guy. I don't need to know either. That has nothing to do with anything. I could care less. It's pretty interesting to wake up to that kind of a, a... So we all have different types of knowledge. We keep responding to the same things. And yet every time Dan Vogel kicks out a new book, Bill Real and RFM have a new interview. I have a new live session, etc. Brent Metcalf shows up with a new article in the John Whitmer Historical Society. On and on and on and on and on. Ryan Larson now, he has uh, new insights and ideas. And we're still all learning. And I mean, that's just, you know. Oh, Radio Free Mormon, thank you, my friend. You are beyond, you're very kind. Anyway, it's a lot of fun. Uh, that's what I'm saying. You guys are just a lot of fun. That's all there is. Which eight hours do you eat at Huff Daddy? Oh, I thought you was asking me. I have discovered a secret to my diet <laughs> when I can ever stick to it. Um, I have to not eat after 6 p.m. Isn't that weird? Because see, by the time I wake up, get a shower and all that jazz, I have to get off to work, right? So. I mean, it's not like I have a long way to commute, but so I eat a big lunch. But if I can at all not eat after 6 p.m., then I can begin losing weight. That's my secret. I'm not trying to speak for you, Huff Daddy. You can go ahead and give her your own answer. 30 pounds. Way to go, Huff Daddy. And it's still off? Oh, wow. Genuflect to you. I'm not worthy. Although you got to keep your eye on your opponent. That's what Bruce Lee taught, you know, when you don't do this or he'll kick you in the face, right? It's Jeet Kune Do for you. Smoke screen master. Yeah, right, Doug? That's, he is. One cent short. Oh, no, no, no. It's never short. Paul Osborne. You guys, if you're not over on Shade's message board reading Paul Osborne, that's the other one I meant to mention. No kidding. I'm glad you're here, Paul. Paul has some sensational stuff on the book of Abraham for a message board. He's able to bring in all kinds of uh, photos and charts. I mean, he, he'd been doing some stuff on the uh, Book of Mormon geography. I kind of talked about that in one of my videos. Seriously, Paul Osborne, he's another one that just comes up with all kinds of great stuff. So, yeah, I didn't mean to leave you out, Paul. You are definitely one of the Book Abraham boys. And Ryan Larson, I love that you're sharing your analysis. Yeah, none of us claim to have all the answers. I promise. Dan Vogel never has. Radio Free Mormon hasn't, although he's close. <laughs> Me, I'll never get there. That's why I ride on the coattails of everybody else. That's why I quote all you other guys. 
But yeah, no, that this is all good, Ryan. Oh, and I was going to say, Quentin Barney in his master thesis on the book of breathings, he got some good stuff. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to start dialoguing with him. I haven't even really given you a chance yet, Ryan. I still haven't. I mean, I am reading your, I am reading your stuff, and I, I find it real interesting. I just, I just have to put two and two together because I don't want to leave something out and make you mad or nothing. So, but I'm glad you're sticking around. This is good. You're welcome to hang out with us for the next 299 years, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, baby. Hopefully, we'll have some barbecues between now and then, right? Okay, there's there's 40 of us here. Hey, I'm I'm coming up on two and a half hours, man. One eighty five down to one fifty five. Good on you, Huff Daddy. Seriously, congratulations. I'm impressed. You're inspiring. I I will, uh, you know, I'll tell myself, hey, if he can do it, I can do it. That's awesome. That's really cool. A lamb, lamb, wah, wah. <laughs> Radio Free Mormon, dude, you're incredible. Oh well, thanks, Ryan. Yeah, I I just don't want you to take it personally at all. Really, truly, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled. I got a, another friend. I can talk really good, serious stuff. Wayman 29 is that way with biblical stuff and all. Oh, Wayman, I was going to tell you three books. You asked me about three books. I'm sorry. I told you McDonald, Gospel, and Homer. Uh, the, another, hold on. Oh, I'm sorry, Wayman. You're probably, you should have yelled at me. Here's another Wayman. Now, I haven't read all the way through this one yet. This is his most recent, William Dever, Beyond the Texts. He's he's huge in biblical archaeology. You know that because we've had talks like this one, 2017. Get the look how thick it is. I mean, I freaking huge it, man. I'm I'm making my own index in the front of the book, like I always do. But uh yeah, we ought to read this one together, Wayman. That'd be fun. I, I plan on doing videos on this one. Absolutely. Great book. Um, what is another one that I could tell you about? What what subject are you interested in, Wayman? You have to tell me. Hey, email me. We'll we'll get together and I'll share some of my stuff that I'm, I'm doing a lot more chess now too. And I am doing the esoteric stuff. I'm trying to do esoteric materials uh, with Trevor Luke. He was here tonight too. Him and I are kind of looking into the esoteric stuff. Just like I try to do the scholar, kind of critical scholar stuff with Paul Osborne over there on Shades Message Boards. Oh, patty cake. Yeah, whatever. Oh, yeah, Radio Free Mormon and Bill will. Yeah, I won't. I'm just small meat and potatoes. That's just the way it is. Yeah, you're welcome, Wayman. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk some more. I'll... uh I got kicked off Facebook years ago because I was so obnoxious. That was when I was going through my faith crisis and I beat the hell out of a Mormon apologist and they turned me in as a fishing site. And so, you know, Facebook kicked me off and they won't let me back. So I would communicate with you Facebook, but I can't. So I, but I've, I've got ways I can get a hold of you. So I will. LDS wife, we should be asking our bishop for guidance. Well, I will. I'll ask the bishop for guidance too. In what? All right. <laughs> Tackle the problem of consciousness. No, nah, that's too deep for me. <laughs> Mormon apologetics is much easier. <laughs> Actually, consciousness would be a cool subject, too. It would. All right, you guys, it's 223. 
two hours, 23 minutes. People are going to see this and they're going to wonder what in the heck was he blabbing about for so long. So, um, although there are 39 of us and we're having a good discussion, I hate to shut it off. It's kind of fun. Mormon Stories Podcast, BYP, Mark Crispin. Uh, Delenn and I have talked about that. I do believe it is in the works. Thank you for the suggestion, but he's got much more important people than me. I'm basically a nobody, but hey, I'm a fun nobody. So yeah, we've actually talked and and I think that'll happen. Um, every now and then I do get a show up. I know their Derek Lambert is talking to me again, the gentleman that owns Myth Vision. Uh, video podcast, Myth Vision. He wants me to get on there again. And then my other friend, Neil, uh, who owns, he's the Gnostic informant. He wants me to get together with him on his videos, channels, and do, uh, do a series on Mormonism. And I'd like to do that too. So keep watching those guys too. They're awesome. They're good to watch. They're very good people. I love those guys. Dabbled in physics. Trevor Henderson, uh, a little bit. I, I really honestly never did get good with physics or math, but I played with it a little bit. I wasn't, I wouldn't say I'm overly good. But yeah, I, I do, you know, I've read a lot of popularizer stuff and the basic history for the public and all that. So somewhat, yeah. Why, you want me to do a physics podcast? Okay, Wayman, thank you for showing up. Yeah, yeah, I think you'll enjoy the first part. Yep, let me know what you think. Yeah. Swing down from the enormous thermos. <laughs> well, thank you, Patty Kick. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think it's a matter of being too modest. I think it's a matter of stating the facts. Oh... Okay, Chris Pierce, thank you for showing up. I'll see you next Sunday. Next Sunday, I'm going to uh, take on Carrie Mulstein a little bit. So anyway, I, I'm going to go ahead and go. Uh, I love all of you. You're awesome. You're a wonderful audience. I appreciate it. Thank you for all your support financially, psychologically, spiritually, physically, realistically, awesomely, and backyard professorly. Uh, I will be back next Sunday. I hope to see absolutely every one of you. Don't forget Wednesday nights, Mormonism Live is also another program. Don't forget Dan Vogel's videos. Don't forget to come to Shade's Message Boards and read Paul Osborne's information. And on and on and on. I like all of you. I love all of you. I'm going to head out, though. So, yeah, it was fun, Doug. It really was. I will, Mark. I'll see you guys next week. I, I am going to close off. It's been two and a half hours. That's long enough. Sorry to shut y'all off. But we'll gab and BS next Sunday also after the show, all right? I love doing this with you guys. This is awesome. Night, Radio Free Mormon. Appreciate you showing up. Always good to see you, of course. Every one of you. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it. Paul? Yeah. yeah. Paul, you've got my number. <laughs> you devil, you. I love you, man. You're awesome. You're the one Texas person I really do appreciate. I'm not even kidding. Okay, I got to go. See you all next week. Have a great week. Be safe, do good, be well, have fun, and come back, y'all, here. All right, this is it. I am gone, Johnson.